fantastic job of working for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, um, running the Badger Vaccination Project, and I've been with them from 2015. Uh, before that, um, I started running, um, I've been a committee member of the High Peak Badger Group, um, which has, has been absolutely fantastic and, and a, a real joy um, of the job. Um, so, I'm going to start with badgers. Um, most of you might have been to the talk last year. We so, can't, so we can't see you. Can you see it there? It's either that or we move chairs. But are you okay to do it? Yeah, I'm fine there. Can you see the screen there? Yeah. So we're going to start with badgers because they're there oh, yeah. by like, love and, and job and uh, the pride of what we do. Um, and, and we work, I work alongside um, uh, High Peak Badger Group, so even though I do badgers for the Wildlife Trust, for my sins I get dragged into things um, within the Badger Group. Um, so we'll start with the Badger Vaccination in Derbyshire. It's a volunteer-led project. Um, it's one of the most successful projects um, in the country. It's led by volunteers. And um, we have over 100 volunteers that help us. So I'm the only paid person. Um, all the volunteers help me to complete this uh, project. Um, and, we, and we've got nurses, doctors, policemen, uh, retired people, vets, um, doctor, you name it. We've got everything that you can think of that are helping us. Um, to uh, you know, lead this project. We've successfully vaccinated over 1,400 badgers since we've been going. Some of you might not think that's a lot, but it is when you look at some of the places that we go to where there's only a couple of badger sets that have two or three badgers in, but that's the aim is to vaccinate a badger. It's not about how many you vaccinate, it's about just vaccinating those numbers um, that are on farms. And we get really, really, really good numbers. Sometimes we're very lucky we get three um, in a trap. Sometimes we get two, and sometimes we get what we call an airthristic badger. Um, and that's a badger um, that's got a different uh, dynamic in its um, red cells so instead of having the normal um, black and white face like you can see here the pigmentation is different so they they are ginger and white and it's quite interesting in the high peak um, and in mid Derbyshire because we get quite a lot of these badgers and we think it's got something to do with the soil content um, and how they've evolved with where they are and what they forage um, and what they eat. So our badgers are vaccinated. They're clipped and stop marked. So you'll see the clip mark here. So the badger's vaccinated in his big hind muscle here um, and then released. Um, we, it doesn't cause any perturbation effect, which it does with culling. Um, so our badgers are quite happy to continue with their wildlife after we've vaccinated them, even though we've trapped them. Um, and, th and they're quite happy just to run off home to bed when they've even been trapped in a trap maybe for four or five hours. Just a bit of a slow-mo for you, just so you can see how they are. They're quite happy after they've been vaccinated to go back to their um, normal life. So that's the badger vaccination side of things. I, I could talk for hours about that side of it, obviously, but I don't, some of you have heard it all before and some of you are volunteers, so I don't want to 
um, you know, go on to it too much. Um, the High Peak Badger Group um, do a lot of badger cub rescue and release, and this is something I'm really passionate about. So aside from my job with Derbyshire Wildlife Trust vaccinating the badgers, um, I spend a lot of time rehabilitating cubs and, and injured badgers. Um, much to uh, probably the annoyance of my partner David, um, because we have a lot of cubs in the house. <laughs> they can be a bit smelly and they can be a bit, well, very noisy uh, at night time. They're obviously nocturnal animals. Um, so, yeah, they're awake when we're supposed to be having to sleep. Um, but it, it, it's, it, nevertheless, it's enjoyable. So, all these cubs here, these are cubs that we've saved um, as a group. And we normally get the cubs coming in and we'll start getting them in round about now. Um, they're tested three times um, for TB, so they don't want to be releasing any cubs back into the wild because what we want to do is work with farmers um, and the community um, and help um, you know, to re reduce incidence of um, TB. So they're tested every month um, and then they will be vaccinated on release. Climate change has had, unfortunately, over the last four years of our records, had a massive impact on young cubs coming in. And that's because between April and May, the weather conditions are so much different for our wildlife than they used to be. So in April, um, we get a lot more, probably April's worse than June, July actually at the moment, um, the drier um, seasons. So the badgers can't forage for their normal um, worms, the ground's too hard. Um, so they're struggling massively. Uh, not, they're not just the only species. Um, so we're getting a lot of cubs in um, that are dehydrated and starving to death. Um, really bad cases. Um, so we're working with other wildlife um, uh, um, sorry, we're working with other wildlife rescues to get these badgers uh, back into rehabilitation. And it's really difficult because it's not just a simple thing of getting the cubs in and rehabilitating them. Where do they go when you've done something with them? And badgers are very territorial. Uh, we've got the problem of where do you release them back to? And it's, we're, we're really fortunate because we've got the Badger Vaccination Project going that we've got a really good um, relationship with farmers and landowners around the community. So we can approach them and ask them if they would be willing um, to have an artificial set built. Um, if, they've not, if they haven't got not, uh, room for an artificial set, we can look at sets that are um, closed, that badgers have moved on from, or maybe where the badgers have um, left it um, and, and, and they're what we call an empty badger set. Uh, if we do that, we have to do camera work for about six months on an empty badger set, because what we don't want is to then go and release a group of cubs um, when there may be um, a, a wild badger moving around in the premises. Um, so that's a really difficult thing to do. We've, we've been successful enough to do it on two occasions, but on all the other occasions, we've had to build an artificial set. These types of sets um, cost around £1,500 to build uh, because of the digging that you have to do within the ground and the pipe work. And, but they are really, really successful things to do. Um, so it, you know, we, we work really hard with people um, and farmers and landowners to be able to do this um, in the area. This one's actually at Whaley Bridge. Um, so we, we have an, an ecologist that works with us um, and he has this technique of having a chamber uh, full of straw, um, the tubes going out and then two exit points 
Um, that's all filled in over the top, so you wouldn't see it. So you just see the, the entrance of the pipes. Um, and we put the cups back in there. Um, and this just shows you, this was only around six months after um, the artificial set was put in. Uh, like I say, we keep the camera work up and we, and we keep going with our little badger ears. <laughs> Badgers are quite funny. They they know when there's a camera around, so you know they're, they're not shy. They'll they'll know when it's there. Once they've got used to it, they'll carry on behaving as normal. Once we put the badges out into an artificial set or um, an empty badger set, we obviously have to supplementary feed them. We can't just you know put them in there and expect them to be able to do what they do even though, you know, after time they will. Um, so it's a really, really um, sort of lengthy task. We've got a really good group of volunteers. Um, we'll supplementary feed for two weeks every single day, and then we'll drop it down as we go along, and that's just to get the badges used to um, being fed within that area where we are. And it doesn't take them long. Um, whether it's an artificial badger set or whether it's um, a, a, an empty badger set, they seem to do quite well. They seem to sort of just slot in and fit in, um, like most um, species do. What do you feed them on the artificial feed? Peanuts. Just peanuts? Peanuts or dog food, yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll put bowls of peanuts and things out and we'll, we'll, um, we'll put um, dog food out. These cubs, this, this was actually only a couple of days after they, they'd been released. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen a badger collecting bedding, um, but it's backwards. And they go, they can actually go miles doing this. So, um, certainly up Digley, um, there's, a, there's a badger set on the left-hand side. When the um, haze cut, uh, and, it, and, they've, and they've cleared it and they've got the bales in, there'll be bits of straw and uh, bits of hay left. You'll see a long strewn line of where the badgers collected it together and then gone backwards um, to get, like I say, they, they'll, go, they'll go for a long time to get it back to the badger set if that's what they like to do. These cubs were released, uh, these were the ones that were, were released in Whaley Bridge. Um, this is us feeding them peanuts not long after. Um, and they're just quite happy. You can see how young they are there. Um, that we, we, we retrap these badges every year and vaccinate them. Um, and that they're still about and still um, doing well. Do we have to be Excuse vaccinated me. every every um, year? Every year, yeah. yeah. Four so years. Done. Yeah. 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 We have to be vaccinated every year, do we? We do. Um, so what DEFRA and <coughs> Natural England recommend is to vaccinate over a four-year period. So every year for four years. Yeah. You can go on for longer if you want to. Um, or, you know, if the farmer or landowner uh, wants us to. But um, to get that... Um, to, you know, to get the herd immunity up within that community yeah. of badgers, four years is, is what we suggest. Yeah. Okay. So, for my sins, <laughs> I very stupidly last year um, contacted the Otter Trust um, and said I would be happy um, to get involved with uh, the rehabilitation of otters. Um, there was nobody at the time available to do it um, in Derbyshire, so they were quite pleased for me to, to offer. Um, we've got a really, really brilliant uh, wild um, otter, a population of otters, which, which is great. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say too much about where they are and stuff, because we're not allowed to, but... Um, the population over the last two years since I've been involved has, has been absolutely amazing and I'm, I'm really pleased that they're doing really well. Um,
but then you, you, then you get involved in having them brought in, which is fine. <laughs> but then you've got to feed them and you've got to look after them and you've got to have somewhere for them to go. With badger cubs, um, you can have them for around six months before they need re-releasing. Re, uh, re with otters, it's 12 months because they're with the parents longer than badger cubs are. So you can't just release them and have them after a little while. So otter cubs are a lot more difficult. Um, nevertheless, we thought, okay, we'll give it a go. We'll see. Um, one of the reasons why is because somebody who sat in the audience actually saw an otter in their garden, um, which got me started on uh, trying to yeah, have a go at, at re-releasing them. So Will was found in a flood drain in Whaley Bridge. Um, he was squeaking and squalling and uh, we got a phone call to say, could we go and try and catch him? Um, we managed to get him in a fishing net, but then we were like, what do we do with him next? So we had him for 24 hours. He wasn't very happy about having anything to eat. He'd been through a bit of a stressful time. Um, so all he wanted to do was have a sleep, uh, which he did. Um, and once he'd recovered, um, he did start eating well. Um, very cute little things, I do have to say. So the Otter Trust um, and Stake, we work with Stakey Grange um, and we try where we can um, to get otters paired up together. So we, we were really, really lucky um, because we also had, here's our little titan or a little yawn and a snooze. Oh, sorry, I'll go back one. Titan, sorry, from Wayne Bridge. Will was from the uh, Pavilion Gardens in Buxton, um, stuck down a flood drain. Um, so Will and Titan were put together and I was really keen to get them back to Derbyshire. I didn't want them to end up going anywhere else. Um, and we were really pleased to get them back in um, September just. Um, and they were, they were released um, into the River Boy. Um, and they're still doing okay and, and very happy there. Uh, so that was quite nice. <coughs> so, other wildlife uh, in the High Peak. There's a fabulous farm in Whaley Bridge called Sun Art. Some of you might have heard about it. Um, they are a couple um, that have rewilded an old dairy farm. So they're doing everything they can to get things back to normal um, and to get things like rewilded um, and, and have a, a really, really good um, wildlife uh, sort of um, intervention with things. They work with Derbyshire Wildlife Trust um, and we've been dead lucky to work with them and build um, a hide on the farm there. This was one of the first captures that we got um, from the camera that was inside the hide. We actually built the hide um, outside the artificial badger set, um, but the foxes took it over. So the cubs that we were supposed to release that year um, had to wait um, because these little guys decided um, that, that, that they were going to... Um, take over and, and use it as theirs. Um, there's also deer around. Um, they use pigs to truck, uh, to snuffle everything um, so they don't plough anything or they just use like old farming techniques and stuff which is really good. <coughs> the change in it in two years is absolutely unbelievable. Um, the wildlife meadow that's now grown and, and all these things is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and if you get a chance, have a look at them on Facebook um, on, and on social media. They've got a really good volunteer group. So if you want to go and do a bit of um, dry stone walling or any other things, um, you know, they're quite happy for you to go. This is um, one of the badger sets that we vaccinate. Um, 
and one of the we found one of the foxes trying to have a little mooch at the uh, peanuts that we've got under the stone. Quite happy to share, you know, many many foxes and badgers share a badger set um, or a den. Uh, they don't mind. They're quite happy to uh, to share together. And then we come to hedgehogs, which is my absolute passion at the moment, and that's because they're on the red list. So it's really, really unfortunate. My first experience of hedgehogs was over on the allotment of Furnace Vale, so just across here. And I had a phone call off one of the residents who said um, that uh, two baby hedgehogs had been left under a rhubarb leaf. Um, they'd been monitoring it for about five or six hours. The mum hadn't come back. So I said, okay, reluctantly, I'll go and have a look and we'll see what goes on. I got there um, and they were two tiny weeny little hoglets like this big. Um, and it was my first success story with, with hedgehogs. Um, which is quite difficult to do because they are really, really difficult um, animals to look after. They can look okay, but within an hour can deteriorate really badly um, and they're very difficult to look after. So I looked after, well, we called them Ant and Deck at that <laughs> moment. The volunteers met <laughs> them um, and we actually got them. Um, so we got them from feeding um from a syringe with milk to taking uh cat food mushed up next level um, and they went back to um, somebody's garden on the other side of yearton lane here who has a hedgehogs already and um, the thing with hedgehogs is you have to have a guaranteed area so it, you need to know that there are hedgehogs in that area before you can release one Otherwise, they die a very lonely death. So we, you need to know that there, there is already a population there. Um, and there's a couple of people, like I say, on the, on the opposite side that do see hedgehogs on a regular basis. So it's a perfect place for us um, to release Ant and Deck. Um, you can put, by licence, um, a bit of nail varnish on the back of them. So we put um, a, a blue on one and, and another type of blue on the other. Um, and, and kept cameras up so we could see um, the progression of Ant and Deck, and they did really well. Um, we'll I've then gone on to release another six hedgehogs over that way in that area. Um, so a, re a really, really good place for them to go, um, and, and obviously doing quite well. But the thing with hedgehogs is, like I say, they deteriorate really quickly, so they're really hard to look after. Um, they've got to be between five and six hundred grams um, before you can release them, especially if it's um, when they're hibernating. So when you come to November time, uh, when they're getting ready to hibernate, you can't release a hedgehog unless it's up to that weight. So that what means then is that you end up with them being um, stuck in a, a wildlife hospital or, or with you. So my aim this year, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, with your help, is to try and make Furnace Vale a hedgehog-friendly village. It's been done in a lot of places, um, and I think we, we, we're, we've got a really good population. Um, so you want a garden um, that's got places where you can leave wild, where you've got a few logs, where you've got a few little bits of habitat, where you don't mow your lawn, where it's not too pristine, um, and you can just leave it a little bit wild and a little bit natural. If you've got fencing, you want a little bit of a cutway in your fencing so that the hedgehogs can get in and out. Um, three of the biggest reasons for the decline in hedgehogs and why they're on the red list is loss of habitat, strimmers, and slug pellets. So if you can try not to use your strimmers and your slug pellets in mm -hmm. Furnace Bale, that would be absolutely fabulous. There's loads of other tips I can give you. I won't go into it now, but 
there's a lot of things you can use. Um, but if, if we could try and do that, we could try and get on the map a little bit with our hedgehog population. Um, like I say, we, we already know that we, we, we know where they are. And if you see them, um, and if you want to tell me about them, um, or if you want me to come round to any of your gardens um, and, and just give your advice on you know what, what, how you can make it a little bit better for them, I'm quite happy to do that. Um, and, and make it, you know, a lot better for them and see, you know, we can certainly do some um, research and report on um, how, how we can best populate it um, and keep it going. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would be absolutely fabulous if we, if we could do that for them because they are struggling massively. Definitely There's not. two wildlife rescues that I know that have got over 200 hedgehogs in their care um, through either string injuries or slug pellet poisoning um, or just loss of habitat and not being able to feed themselves because they can't get through the corridors within your gardens to be able to get through to where they need to go. Um, there's also um, wildlife hospitals that are willing to put you on a register. So if you wanted um, some hedgehogs in your garden um, and it's if you're quite handy and, and you know a little bit about um, woodwork and stuff, it only costs about six pounds to make a hedgehog house to have in the back of your garden. Um, so I think we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more on, on, on another um, sort of talk sometime or I'm happy, like I say, to meet people um, and go through what we can do to try and make Furnace Vale hedgehog friendly. And get there. Are they eating slug pellets or do they eat things that have eaten?